The Prophet with Purpose conversation continues. Uh, you could almost imagine this morning session as a symphony in three different movements. Uh, we started with a very rich discussion where Bill promised to kick up some dust around defining the terms of impact investing, uh, both individually as well as collectively. We're now going to move that conversation into the intersection between business and trust, and how does that intersection play into our understanding of these questions. Uh, Bill asked the question of the panel, what skill did he feel that MBA students needed to bring to the equation? If I got to answer that, which now I do because I have the podium for 30 seconds, I would say it's communication, which is the field that I teach here, that you have got to be able to in a compelling way speak and write about your passion in order to enroll other people in it, whether as investors or employees or board members or partners. And so the next part of our symphony here really lets us look at uh, communication in an interesting way. Uh, I'm gonna welcome up here uh, Paul Vandermark and Mark Haas. Uh, you can read their bios in your uh, program. I'll just briefly share that Paul Vandermark is the Chief Products Officer of Risk Management Solutions. Uh, for all of us in Northern California, he plays an important role looking at mitigating the risk of earthquake. Please go ahead and, and have a chair. Uh, and uh, he will be uh, in conversation with Mark Haas, who is the President and CEO of Edelman, uh, which has a, a tremendous history uh, in our country of really leading our efforts in corporate communication. And Mark, I just found out you co-authored one of the chapters in Reputation Management, the textbook I just adopted for the spring class I'm teaching in Reputation Management. Had I known, I'd have brought it for an autograph. But <laughs> I, I wasn't, wasn't clued in until I read your bio this morning. Uh, they will now take us into a conversation about the intersection between business and trust. And I'll turn it over to the two of you. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you, J.D., for the very kind um, and, and complete introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll give you that autograph anytime you want if it really is important. But um, uh, My name is Mark Hass. Good morning. I'm the uh, U.S. Uh, Chief Executive Officer of Edelman Public Relations. Uh, Edelman is a global communications consultancy that has had a special interest, as J.D. mentioned, in, in issues surrounding uh, trust and how businesses specifically uh, can build and keep trust so that they can operate more freely. Uh, with me today is uh, Paul Vandermark, who is the uh, Chief Product Officer of RMS, uh, Risk Management Solutions, and what better company to have on the podium to talk about questions of trust than one whose first name is Risk. Um, we are gonna try to answer the question today, how does social purpose and business affect questions of trust. So I'd like to start out, Paul, by maybe asking you to introduce yourself very briefly, talk about what RMS does, and then, and then put social purpose in the context of how you operate. Well, good morning, and I'd like to thank the organizers for having, having me here as well this morning. As a Stanford graduate, uh, it's a uh, it's great, uh, great pleasure of an opportunity to be back on campus and, and talk about topics like this. I. Um, I'm an anomaly of sorts, I suppose, um, in my era, and then I've worked at one company for 22 years. And I, uh, I joined RMS as a, a senior, working part-time during my senior year at Stanford, and I'm still there. And what we do as a business is we help the insurance industry manage catastrophe risk. And the core of that business is building catastrophe models to quantify, to simulate and then quantify the risks from Today, a wide range of potential events, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, terrorism, infectious disease, and to help the insurance industry by understanding the risk, better manage it. And that's, that's been our focus for the last two decades. And part of what we've been on over that time is a journey in understanding how we can have impact beyond just our business activities. And I'd say from the very beginning, we've always had a, a greater sense of purpose than the business simply being about growing a business and generating financial return. There's always been this, this uh, the sense of purpose and mission we've had that part of what we can do through our work is to help create a more resilient society 
There's the, the saying we all are familiar with, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And for us, a lot of the problem in, in responsible, rational management of catastrophe risk and mitigation of risk is understanding it in the first place and quantifying it so you can make good decisions about it. And for us, that's always been a, been a core part of our mission as an organization to not just help our clients do what they do well and grow a su successful business, but also to have greater impacts um, on society through our work. Can, can you, I imagine, you know, given your 20 year tenure, you've seen the evolution of social purpose in your organization as it has evolved in the corporate sector. 20 years ago, we would have been having a very different conversation about this topic. Can you talk about how social purpose has evolved in your organization and give some examples of the things you do? Well, it's, it's been a journey and one that's not over, so I can tell you what the, what the journey's been like, and I think the, I would characterize as having three, three phases we've been through over our history. So the, the, the early phase was we were in startup mode, and job number one was to survive, to create a company that was successful and, and stuck around. And we weren't, we, well, it was clear we'd have no impact if the company wasn't in existence anymore. So we all, as a relatively small group, early days, shared that sense of purpose, but the focus was very much have impact through our work by making the company successful. And one early sign of, of confidence we gained, that I can give you as an example, that our work was indeed having an impact, was the 1994 Northridge earthquake in Southern California. So after Hurricane Andrew, just two years earlier, a number of insurance companies um, couldn't pay the claims that came in. They were insolvent because they didn't understand the risk well enough and went out of business. After Northridge, we saw tangible examples of clients coming to us saying, through our use of your products, over the past several years, we've re-underwritten our portfolio understood what we had concentrations, diversified, built a more balanced book of business, and we could pay all our claims, and we're still here. So to us, that was a good sign of we're making a difference. The work we're doing is resulting in, in people being able to get their claims paid after years of paying, paying uh, insurance premiums. For those all, all of us who live in Northern California and buy earthquake insurance, you can appreciate that when the event does come, you expect your insurance company to be around and to be able to pay the claim. Then... As the company became more established, I'd say we went through a period of, of finding our voice in finding more direct ways to have impact. And it's, insurance in some cases can be highly politicized. And we were careful to make sure we weren't getting involved from a political angle. But it was clear to us that there were opportunities to help inform the public debate about making more rational decisions about risk and the management of it, the mitigation of it, the financing of it, and so forth. And so we started finding more deliberate opportunities to contribute to the public debate. And one example I can give you is, is after the events of September 11th. Everyone probably remembers the, the photos of, of police departments and fire departments in the middle of Wyoming with brand new multi-million dollar gear to fight terrorists and biohazard response vehicles and heavy weaponry. And, and there's an obvious question of, is that really rational that you'd invest federal funds and other funds in, in terrorist activities in places where you're very unlikely to have terrorist events. And so part of what we did working with others like the RAND Corporation was we took our terrorism models and applied them and our expertise in helping advise the federal government and other stakeholders on how you can take or how to implement a more risk-based approach to managing risk, including disbursement of funds to mitigate and, and defend against the risk. And that was an example of us getting more involved and seeing very successful impact in the work ultimately resulting in a much more risk-based approach to, to disbursement and spending of those sorts of funds. And then I'd say the phase we're in now is we're today a company that employs 1,200 people around the world. We're almost 300 million in revenue. And it's been, in a way, time to walk the walk, if you will. It's not enough just to say to all of our employees, you should have confidence that our activities indirectly have a positive impact on society through our work, nor to limit our involvement to, say, ad hoc, pro bono sorts of work. It's been a time for us to say, look, we're profitable, we're established, and how do we contribute in a more sort of systematic way to social innovation to address issues of risk that are relevant to our business and our broader sense of mission? And, and I can tell you an example of the, maybe the most substantial thing we've done is in the developing world. 
And part of what's been a great source of anguish for us over the years is that our work naturally focuses mostly on the developed world, to some extent on the developing world, and it's very much a function of, of insurance take up. So we work in places that our clients as the insurance industry are writing insurance. What we all continue to see though is these tragic catastrophes around the world in Indonesia and in Pakistan and Haiti just last week in the Philippines. And we look at these events and we say, well, our work is having little to no impact in reducing risk in these parts of the world because we don't interact with them through our normal business activities. So one thing we've done now is that we've partnered with an innovative nonprofit uh, social enterprise called Build Change, whose mission is to change construction practices in the developing world in areas that are earthquake prone to reduce future casualties from earthquakes. Um, they've had great success over the past nine years. There are now 160,000 people who are living in earthquake safe homes through their work in Indonesia, in China, in Haiti. They're now expanding into Latin America. They're also expanding the mission to include schools. And at RMS for the past several years, we have been supporting them in several ways. So financially, um, in fact, we just, just made a new commitment of a million dollars in funding to support them over the next several years in their work around the world. We support them through a variety of employee engagement activities where employees can, can help with their expertise to advance the work of the organization, and I personally serve on the board. And so for us, that's given us an avenue to have a direct impact on reducing risk in these other parts of the world that we don't otherwise touch through our business activities. So that today we've gotten to a point where we have a portfolio of activities that address both the communities we live and work in, in the developed world, and the developing world. So I, would, I, I can clearly understand how um, uh, trust is a key part of your, of your business proposition. Your, your customers are making billion dollar decisions based on whether they trust your models or not. So I would understand how things like product quality and other kinds of um, factors would drive trust in your organization. Rounding back to the, the question of how uh, purpose helps build trust. Can you talk about um, maybe that last example or other examples of how these activities that RMS has been involved in around the world has helped uh, strengthen the bond of trust between the company and your customers? It's a great question. I'd say for us, there are two bonds that are important. The bond between us and our employees and that with our, our clients or business partners. And for us, this this part of our activities is critical to both. And starting with employees, for us, it's about being an employer of choice. Uh, we're a business that depends on talent, much of it from this institution and others like it in the world. And people have a choice where they go to work. And for us, we found that people prefer to work in a place where they feel like they're making a difference. They're part of something bigger than just delivering returns to shareholders. And we, uh, we believe it's been an important factor in both attracting and retaining talent over the years. And similarly, on the, the client side, I wouldn't go so far as to say that clients choose to work with us because of our purpose or our involvement in social innovation. But I certainly have confidence in saying that once a client is a client, that that part of who we are and our brand and our activities as an organization plays a role in the relationships we develop um, at a very senior level in those organizations. And we, as you referenced, we have relationships with clients that, that span decades. This is a business in which we have long-term, deep personal relationships. And, and for our clients, it makes a difference to work with an organization like us who have that, that sense of purpose. I suspect that you face the same challenge that a lot of people uh, in this room from the from the corporate sector face, and that is justifying your investment. I mean, a lot there are a lot of soft metrics around around purpose it helps us attract employees, et cetera, et cetera. How do you how do you talk to skeptics? How do you build the case for um, investments and in purpose at RMS? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I would say to the, the MBA students in the room, I would, the, the simple answer I would give you is that as with almost any other really important decision we make, there's no quantitative proof that helps you make the decision. Ultimately, it comes down to a combination of 
judgment and experience and intuition that it's the right thing to do. So we don't have quantitative proof. You can go put in a graph that says this is why doing this results in these outcomes. But the evidence we do have, which, which we find very compelling, is the evidence you get when you sit in an interview with somebody you want to come work for you. Or you ask our recruiters what happened in the phone call when they called a candidate they want to come work for us and to leave their job somewhere else. And it resonates with people that, that coming to RMS is joining an organization where they are part of something bigger and making a difference in the world. And when they go talk to their family or their friends and they say, what do you do? Where do you work? Um, that becomes surprisingly a big part of the story they tell in addition to what it is they themselves actually do every day at work. So for us, that's, that's the justification. At the, um, uh, at the start of the conversation, I mentioned uh, Edelman's investment in interest in, in trust and trust building. Um, uh, we do an annual study uh, called the Trust Barometer. It's a global study in its 12th year where we try to assess the, the levels of, of trust among key publics and informed publics in key institutions, including business. And one of the interesting findings that has emerged uh, over the last uh, two or three years is not only the dramatic decline in uh, trust in government, as you might imagine, um, uh, the reasons, um, but also the gap between what informed publics expect from business and their perception of what business delivers. There is a gap. Uh, particularly in the purpose area, um, uh, things like environmental um, uh, engagement are being involved in the community, um, uh, giving uh, to charitable causes is table stakes for most businesses now. Nobody gets any credit for it. So my question, my last question for you, Paul, is how do you think, um, uh, what, what should businesses be doing to try to close the gap between the expectations of their key stakeholders in terms of purpose and the perception of how they're, how they're delivering? This is a reputational question and a communications question, really. Well, the, the trend you referenced is certainly one we observe, which is, and I'd say, as we talk to our clients, many of whom are much more established in much larger organizations than ourselves, and I've recently had a number of conversations with, with a number of our clients' chief executives, inviting them to join us in supporting uh, Build Change, the organization I referenced a few minutes ago, is one example of where it plays into the partnership and the relationship with our clients. And what I've observed personally in those conversations is that our clients themselves um, are struggling to figure out what the next generation of corporate social responsibility looks like for them. And in the past, often it's been very focused on civic engagement, supporting the opera or other local institutions. And while that's certainly, that sort of local community support is welcome and has been a great source of funding for many of those institutions, I think many of these organizations are now saying, that isn't particularly related to our purpose, our, our reason for being as an organization. That's just supporting the communities we live in, which as you say is table stakes. People now expect that as part of an organization being responsible and demonstrating they have more than just self-interest in mind. And so we're seeing many of them going on or starting to go on the journey that we ourselves are on, which is, is identifying, articulating, communicating, and then demonstrating engagement in some sense of mission or purpose that is bigger than just delivering returns to stakeholders. And for us at RMS, one of the things we've, we've uh, one of the insights we had in going through this over the past several years is that the two aren't different. Meaning it, we don't articulate a mission for the company and a mission for our corporate social responsibility programs. We talk about one mission as an organization, which is ultimately to help create a more resilient society based on a better understanding and, and management of catastrophe risk. And we, we uh, do that through our work with clients as well as through our our work in social innovation and supporting the types of activities we talked about. So my, my takeaway from what we've done, what I've seen, is that that's, that's the area to focus on, is what is the true purpose of an organization? How do you define that, articulate it in a way that's unique to what you do and relevant to what you do? And how do you engage your employees in that work and not make it only about check writing? 
Uh, well, uh, regrettably, I've only gotten through half my list of questions and we're out of time. So I'd like to, to end by thanking you, Paul, for, for, for joining us today. And, and I'm sure you'll be around for the next few hours in case anyone wants to continue the conversation. And thank all of you for being such a, such a great audience. Thanks very much.